The Bold One. Earl Ives. Joseph Campanella. James Parentino. Lawyers defending justice in the nation's courtrooms. Leslie Nielsen. Harry Rhodes, public servants enforcing the laws of a challenging society. E.G. Marshall. John Saxon. David Hartman, doctors expanding the horizons of the new medicine. The bold ones. Close. Sorry, Counselor, but it's a long haul over here from state prison. Hey, Mr. Darrow, how you been? Fine, Jesse, just fine. Are the handcuffs necessary? Probably not, but they're required regulation. I don't mind them. Governor, a three-year-old child smothered to death in her bed so that her outcries won't alert the parents to the fact that a burglary is being committed. Now, Mr. Darrell would have you believe that a man who prefers committing murder to apprehension as a burglar deserves your intervention. Deserves to be an exception to our laws. Just keep an eye on your client, would you, Mr. Darrell? He almost brained me with a water pitcher after the trial. I wouldn't like to see it happen again. Gentlemen, can we please keep this moving? This man has shown himself to be totally without remorse. Yet, Mr. Darrell contends that he is deserving of having his death sentence commuted. Well, I submit, sir, that nothing has occurred to justify such a contention. He hasn't even seen fit to acknowledge his guilt. If he would do that, there might be some basis for at least... Jesse! 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 Oh, come on, Brian. You don't think I really expected him to react like that, do you? The trouble with you, uh, the trouble with both of us, is we take our work too seriously. Sam, maybe I ought to get a plane back to California tonight. Listen, Marcy, wouldn't let me in the house if I didn't bring you home for dinner. Tell you what, let's make a pact, all right? The subject of Ortega in this hearing is off limits for the evening, and the first one that even mentions it. OK. Truth, did you break the pie or not? Certainly. Hmm. I tell you, I used to think you were an astute fellow. But when it comes to Jesse Ortega, he's really got you kind of hypnotized, huh? take his case in the first place four years ago. You did. Well, what did you want me to do? Pat him on the back and shove him in the gas chamber? No, I wanted the best defense for him that he could get, and he got it. Well? Well, the way you carry on, you really act like you think he didn't kill the cold girl. I don't believe he killed her. Hypnotize, am I right, huh? huh? Oh, you're always right, dear. She thinks I'm right. Oh, she, she always, always thinks, thinks you're right. right. Oh, that's a cute little thing there. If 
I showed you a home movie of Ortega killing the cold girl, you still wouldn't believe it. Now, why don't you face that he's just a bad kid? I know you hate to be a loser, but this case would be... Darn. Loser. This isn't my day. Sam, be 11. Get the vacuum from the garage, please. You know how compulsive I am about the floor. Well, I see. Poor shame. You did that on purpose. Yep. The only argument I let him finish is in court. <laughs> Well, at least you're more subtle now. I can remember the days you used to pour drinks on. I'm more devious, too. The vacuum's at the fix-it shop. <laughs> I'd feel sorry for Sam if I was so burned at him. Yes, I know. Maybe even more than burned, huh? Maybe even disappointed in him a little? Oh, come on, Marcy. I know he's got a job to do. And he doesn't like the gas chamber any more than you do. Oh, Marcy, I never said he did. I remember when they first gave him the Ortega case and told him to go for the death penalty. He was miserable. Till he got the notion of asking you to defend. I guess he thought it would be easier for him if he knew that Ortega was getting the best. And even in law school, Sam always thought you were the best. Brian. I think you're just about the closest friend Sam's got. Don't lose that over Jesse Ortega. Please don't. I suppose I just make a little pass at his wife instead. Well, uh, since I seem to be making a career out of being an interfering woman, I think I'd better get to work and get you married off. How would you like to meet a nice... Fine. Bring him on. The more the merrier. You know me. <laughs> I can't find the vacuum cleaner in the garage or anywhere else, huh? Oh, never mind, dear. I didn't need it after all. Hello. Hello. Boy, I hate that. Nobody on the other end. Sound like glass breaking. Will I come down and take a look? Why don't you look out there? I'll look at you. Yeah, okay. Maybe I won't have to shoot you. Sam, well, there's nothing up. Stand over by him. I'm sorry you're here, Mr. Darrow. But it don't make no difference. Jesse, what are you doing here? Sit down. Both sit down. If I have to shoot you, I will. Sit down. Jesse, how do... What happened? There was an accident. I get away. Now I go to Mexico, and you're gonna help me. Oh, Jesse, you're not gonna go any place. Now, come on, give me the gun. Let me call the police. I'll tell them you came here to turn yourself in. <sighs> so they can't kill me in the gas chamber? The governor hasn't announced his decision yet. Now, supposing he's going to commute your sentence. Oh, shut up! What the governor do, I can see already in his face. Where is your wife? She's in Colorado. Her mother's ill. He tell the truth? Yes, Jesse, look, you're throwing away your last chance. Please! Nobody's gonna commute me. You know that, too. I go to Mexico, or I get killed. For something I don't do. You know that, mister? Something I don't do. How much money you got here? A hundred dollars, maybe a little more. Got any money, Mr. Darrell? 
Less than $50, Jesse, which means you haven't got a chance. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Darrow, but I got a chance. I got a good chance. I can go to Mexico. In Mexico, I'm just a peon, a Chicano. Nobody will find me there. I can go where nobody can ever find me. I'm sorry you're here, Mr. Darrow. <gasps> Almighty and most merciful Father, we have left undone those things which we ought to have done and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. <laughs> Please, make your peace now. There isn't any more time. That's what you think, baby. Warden, I got one of those last minute confessions to make. You don't call me today. There isn't time now. Well, it just better not be too late because there's another cat you got nailed for one of my jobs. And I'm the only one who can clear. Sure. Sure, I'll give you two minutes. Tell me all about it. Well, you remember the, uh, the cold kid, right? The cold kid four years ago? I killed her. They never found the rest of the stuff, right? Well, they will now. They'll find it now, because I can tell you where they can go and dig it up. <laughs> Platinum necklace, 16 links, natural rubies. This looks like the stuff, all right. Uh, ladies, platinum bracelet, 34 links, Sam. inch width. Sam. Sam, don't take your grief out on Ortega. Sam. Sam, I think I know how you feel about no, this, but... I don't think you do. Look, I hope you know I'd give anything in the world to be able to change what happened, but I can't, neither can you. Now, what we can do is to make sure a tragic accident doesn't result in another attempt on the life of an innocent man. When your client broke into my house, he committed a felony, and by the laws of this state or any other state, when he killed my wife, he committed murder. Look, there's too much hate in your logic, Sam. Jesse never intended to pull that trigger. It was an accident. That's all you know that. Look, he murdered my wife. Now, doesn't Marcy count anymore? What about her innocence? Doesn't she deserve to be remembered? I remember Marcy, and I'm not afraid to remember her quality. But I think she deserves something better than to be used by her husband as excuse for a judicial lynching. Go away, Sam. You're a better man than this.
I just got your message, Sam. So the chief's going to buy Cleland's confession, hmm? Yeah, right down the line. I don't believe it, but uh, I can't prove it. I think it's a phony. It's just the feeling I have. I'm afraid we lost or take on the coal murder. Brian will ask to have the verdict vacated. I don't see how we can oppose it. So I'm going to recommend that we prosecute Ortega for the homicide of Marsha Rand, murder one. No argument from me. But you have something more in mind, haven't you? I promise you, I guarantee that I will keep my feelings as husband totally no, separate. No, no. No, Sam, forget it. You're emotionally involved. You're a key witness. On both counts, we're on very shaky ground. But I'll, I'll handle this myself. Brian will be a witness, and if I know him, he'll get the court to let him defend. But your situation is different. Charlie, please don't shut me out. I need to stay on this what case. What you need is to take a club and feed Ortega to jelly, but you can't. That's the price we pay for civilization. Now, you just have to live with it, Sam. I'll prosecute. You can assist if you want to. But I'm the man this time. Any threats Jesus Ortega made against Samuel Rand are irrelevant. Since he did not deliberately shoot Marsha Rand, it was neither premeditated nor intended, but the accidental result of an attack on Jesus Ortega by Samuel Rand. He armed himself with a gun only to prevent his recapture, to pursue his viable plan to escape to Mexico and thus preserve his own life. Any man wrongfully sentenced to death with all avenues of appeal exhausted has a right under natural law to resist execution. Is there anything you'd like me to explain, Jesse? It's fine, Mr. Thurr. Real fine. Well, I hope your jury thinks so. <laughs> what jury? Where are you going to find 12 people in the whole rotten world who would even spit at me if I'm burning up? Oh, come on now. It isn't that bad. I don't know. I keep thinking. If I hadn't gone to that house, if I hadn't tried to get away, that Mrs. Rand, she'd still be alive. Now I have killed someone. It doesn't matter anymore. I go to the gas chamber now. You are not going to the gas chamber. Don't ever say that again. Hey, Mr. Tavo, how come? That Mrs. Rand, she was your friend. Ain't you had enough of me? Jesse, it wasn't your fault what happened to Marsha Rand. It was my fault for losing your first trial, for letting an innocent client be sentenced to death. My fault, and I won't quit until I've made up for it. I ain't worth it anymore, Mr. Darrell. Not anymore. I ain't worth it anymore. All right, I'm coming. I'm here. Good Lord, Walt. In the flesh. After a terrible flight on that red eye special. Well, I thought we might have a little chat about the trial tomorrow. I still am a senior member of the firm, ain't I? Or have you and your kid brother made other arrangements behind my back? You flew all the way here for a little chat at three in the morning? Well, I'm operating on Pacific time. After all, the law firm usually practices there. It's just the shank of the evening there. <laughs> Jesse. Now, this is my partner, Walter Nichols. He's going to assist me on defense. Come on. Please rise and face the flag of our country, recognizing the premises for which it stands.
liberty and justice for all. This superior court is now in session. The Honorable Stuart Murkison presiding. Please be seated. The case of the people versus Jesus Ortega is ready for trial. May I remind the gentlemen of the press that no photographs shall be taken in this courtroom during or after the trial. And I need not remind those reporters present that no interviews shall take place in this courtroom during or after the trial. Your Honor, beg the court's indulgence. Recognize counsel for defense. May it please the court, a last minute change in trial dates in California has enabled my learned associate, Walter Nichols, to assist me on defense. I now move for his admission to participate in the case before the court. Mr. Pettit, do you have any objections? No, Your Honor. If Mr. Nichols is acceptable to the court, he is acceptable to the people. So ordered. The court welcomes Walter Nichols as assistant to counsel for defense. I wish to thank the court. I wish to thank the people. I feel myself warmed and touched by the generous hospitality of your sovereign state. Your Honor. Something else, Mr. Darrow? Yes, Your Honor. Defense moves for a change of venue from this judicial district. Hatred, rage, and a climate of vigilante lynch law swept this city following the murder of Susan Cole. Its target was the man accused of the crime, my client, Jesus Ortega. Even though we now have irrefutable proof of his innocence of that crime, Jesus Ortega was brought to trial by the people of this city, found guilty by the people of this city, and sentenced to death by the people of this city. Now, four years later, Cleared of that first murder, Jesus Ortega, tragically involved in another death, is brought to trial again. Now, we believe the problem of finding a fair and impartial jury in these circumstances is impossible. Your Honor, I submit to you now an exhibit in support of this motion. These are the results of a public opinion poll conducted at our request by the sociology department of your state university. The scholars who conducted this survey are available to testify if Your Honor so wishes. The conclusions of the study are clear. In the minds of 96.3% of the people who might be impaneled as jurors, Jesus Ortega has already been found guilty. Now, in the same example, I regret to add, more than 92% have already decided they would vote for the death penalty. I must admit your evidence is as fascinating as your presentation was impressive. But I'm going to deny the motion. The validity of the results of your poll has not been established. But I'm making the denial without prejudice to your right to renew the motion if, when we get down to selecting a jury, your evidence is borne out. No, Your Honor, I cannot accept that kind of risk for my client. I deny your motion, Mr. Darrell. You have to accept it. Begging Your Honor's pardon. There is another way. Rather than go to trial with a jury from this city, we prefer to waive entirely our right to a jury and try the case before the court. Your Honor, I never heard of a defendant who pleads not guilty even attempting such a waiver in a murder case. Now, can we please skip the science fiction, get back to the practice of law? That's what I'm doing, counsel, a practicing law. I'm prepared to discuss the point now, if Your Honor so wishes. But we are not. Your Honor, we had no warning at all about this. All we knew was that there would be a motion for a change of venue. Now, if Your Honor wishes to indulge Mr. Darrell, we will need time to prepare. You've got until tomorrow morning at 10, Mr. Pettit. Court adjourned. Mr. Pettit isn't the only one who caught with his law down. It looks like his honor's going to have to burn some midnight oil, too.
find it anywhere. The People versus McCaffrey, 1958, New York, 172, Supplement 2, page 154. Amazing. Am I like a computer? It is held that a court must approve a defendant's waiver of jury if it is satisfied that he is acting in full understanding of the meaning of his act. Can I say a computer? Or Library of Congress? Do you fully understand that your right to trial by jury is considered a very important safeguard of your individual rights, and that by waiving your right to a jury trial, you are discarding one of your most cherished constitutional guarantees. Yes, sir, Your Honor. But if Mr. Darrell says it's OK, then it's OK. Very well. You may be seated. I'm going to permit the waiver, gentlemen. Proceed. Mr. Pettit, are you ready for the people? Yes, Your Honor. I was waiting for Mr. Darrell to make his next motion. <laughs> I move you get moving, Mr. Pettit. <laughs> well, I hope you have that out of your systems, gentlemen. The next time it happens, the court will have the last laugh with a contempt citation. Now, proceed, Mr. Pettit. Jesus Ortega, what a sad, tragic place he has taken in the lives of all of us. He said, I'm going to Mexico, and you're going to help me. What did Ortega say then? He said, if I've got to kill you, I will. Thank you, Mr. Rand. Your witness. Suppose Jesse Ortega had knocked at your front door politely, explained that the authorities were wrongfully trying to kill him, and asked for your help. What would you have done? Well, the question is irrelevant. It's misleading and calls for a conclusion. Your Honor, would you please instruct Mr. Rand that he is a witness and not opposing counsel? Objection. The question is not material, Your Honor. Objection is overruled. The witness will refrain from instructing this court on points of law. Now, you know better than that, Mr. Rand. Yes, sir. Answer the question. I would have called the police. Because you faced a desperate killer? No, because I faced a fugitive. So, that realistically speaking, the only way Jesse Ortega could expect any kind of help from you was by making threats, is that correct? Yes, it is. And when Jesse did, in fact, threaten you, what was your reaction? Did you see an innocent man driven to desperation, or did you see a killer? I saw a killer. Mr. Rand, you're saying, aren't you, that you still believe he's guilty of killing Susan Cole? Objection. Your Honor, we are not here to retry that case. Your Honor, the attitude of this witness has colored every particle of his testimony. The question of his prejudice goes to the core of the issue before us. Will you approach the bench, please? What are you trying to establish? The prosecution's chief witness is hopelessly biased and that this so-called murder was really an accident caused in part by the tragic misjudgment of this witness. Oh, come now. That's jury talk. You're not going to impress anyone here. All right. I'm going to let you go down this road a little way. But you had best lead us somewhere, Mr. Darrell. I'm not a tourist. The objection is overruled. Continue. I ask you again. Do you still believe that Jesse Ortega was a murderer on the night he came to your home for help? Yes, I do. Mr. Rand. Only a few days ago, his conviction was set aside. Are you saying the court is in error? The state has held the collusion between Ortega and Cullen was possible. I believe they were right. 
Do you remember the first trial well? It hasn't been easy to forget. Do you remember Jesse describing a car from which he saw someone throw a bag? The bag containing the evidence which led to his conviction? Well, I remember a description of a car, but not the details. He described a 1960 blue four-door sedan with Texas license plates. Does that refresh your memory? Now that you bring it up, yes, I think probably. Your Honor, I would like to place in evidence a document which I had intended to use in the hearing for dismissal. It didn't arrive on time, and I felt I had enough evidence, overwhelming evidence, without it. A decision borne out by the court's verdict. Your Honor, I have here a certified copy of a record which arrived yesterday from the state of Texas. It is a registration form dated four years ago on a car owned by Charles Clellan, the man who confessed to the murder of Susan Cole. The car he was driving then was a 1960 blue four-door sedan with Texas license plates. A document accepted and marked as defendant's exhibit next in order. You don't contend the collusion began four years ago, do you? No, I don't. I ask you now, if you had admitted that possibility on the night that your wife was killed, might you have acted very differently? I don't know. Thank you. I have no further questions. Jesus Ortega is a man under sentence of death after a fair trial. Had no right to run away from the wrecked patrol car. He had a duty to turn himself in. Had he done so, Marsha Rand would not have been killed. Samuel Rand acted like a law-abiding citizen, not only in recapturing a fugitive, but in defense of his own life. It cannot then be argued that Marsha Rand's death was the accidental result of Ortega's resistance to recapture. He had no right to resist, and his presence in the Rand home was felonious. It's a well-established principle in law. A killing committed in the perpetration of a felony is murder in the first degree. To say that Jesus Ortega should have given himself up is to deny the whole basis of natural law on which this nation was founded. The American people do not believe the king can do no wrong. But is Jesus Ortega to go unpunished for the death of Marsha Rand? Your Honor, I cannot in good conscience argue that my client should escape punishment for that tragic but totally accidental death. But I do argue with every conviction in my being that Jesus Ortega has paid for Marsha Rand's death, paid for it many times over. Four years in a death cell, four agonizing years awaiting execution for a crime he did not commit. Even for the guilty, it has been argued in every state in this land that long imprisonment awaiting execution is cruel and unusual punishment. Even for the guilty. Now, what kind of punishment is it then for an innocent man? Your Honor, I say to this court that my client has suffered enough. I say the people have had their retribution. Jesus Ortega, please stand. In the broadest sense, this case involves the rights of society and the rights of the individual. Now, society has the right to demand that all members obey its laws and that an individual injured by their application shall resist that application in a lawful manner because the alternative would be anarchy. But if society wrongfully decides to take an individual's life, 
and if he has exhausted every available legal remedy to regain his liberty, he has the right, I believe, to resort to remedies we would in other circumstances call extra-legal. However, it's not a blanket permit entitling the holder to use force in a reckless or wanton manner. Now, as to the present case, when Jesus Ortega forced an entry into the Rand home, when he terrorized Mr. Rand and Mr. Darrell with a pistol, no matter what the motives for doing so, he was engaged in a felony that lost or exceeded that special limited privilege to take extra legal steps to save his own life. Therefore, he is responsible for all the consequences, whether or not foreseen or intended, for his extra legal acts. Jesus Ortega, I find you guilty of murder in the first degree. Before pronouncing sentence, I would appreciate hearing from counsel. Mr. Pettit? If the court please, Mr. Rand will speak for the people. Your Honor, I speak both as an attorney for the state and as the husband of Marcia Rand. In both capacities, I ask not for death, but for the secondary statutory sentence of life imprisonment. There are, as I have come to realize during the course of this trial, many extenuating circumstances, many shared responsibilities for the tragedy of my wife's death. We therefore feel the interests of the people will be fully served by the lesser sentence of life imprisonment. Thank you, Mr. Rand. Jesus Ortega, do you have anything to say before this court pronounces the sentence? I don't want to die. But I don't want to spend the rest of my life in prison, either. I guess I got nothing to say, Your Honor. Mr. Darrow, do you have anything to say? Yes, Your Honor, I have something to say. Jesus Ortega was imprisoned by this state for four years. Four terrible years. He is now acknowledged to have been innocent of that crime. And the state, therefore, owes him an accounting. And if no accounting is now forthcoming, he will become the victim of yet another shocking miscarriage of justice. Mr. Darrell, I've been trying to give you considerable leeway. I recognize your emotional involvement here. But I'm going to bend only so far. Now, for the last time, I ask you, do you have anything to say relative to sentencing? Yes, Your Honor, I do. I have here the state statute on murder. The jury before which any person charged with murder shall be tried shall, if it finds such person guilty thereof, designate by its verdict whether it be murder of the first or second degree. And if murder of the first degree, the jury shall, in its verdict, fix the penalty to be suffered by the person so convicted, either at imprisonment for life at hard labor in the penitentiary or at death. And the court shall thereupon give sentence accordingly. In this trial, Your Honor, a jury was waived. But in first-degree murder cases, only a jury can determine the penalty. The wording of the statute makes it plain. And without its determination, the court lacks all power to impose a sentence. In short, Your Honor, you cannot sentence Jesus Ortega. And the prohibitions on double jeopardy forecloses being tried again. Are you claiming, sir, I have no judicial alternative to setting a convicted murderer free? I merely cite the statute, Your Honor, which is binding on all of us. 
Were you aware of the precise wording of the statute when you moved for waiver of jury? No, Your Honor, not when I made the motion. I discovered it before the court permitted the waiver, however. That seems rather critical timing, Mr. Darrell, doesn't it? I find it very difficult to believe, somehow, that you did not purposely attempt to commit a fraud upon this court from the very start of this trial. Now, that isn't true, Your Honor. If I'm guilty of anything, it's that I chose to remain silent after I discovered the unusual wording of one short section of this state statute on murder. I accept whatever consequences the court wishes to impose on me for that silence. But as Jesus Ortega's attorney, I felt obliged to remain silent. Whatever price I have to pay, I feel that my client's escape from a second miscarriage of justice is worth that price. Is it, Mr. Darrow? Is it indeed? Well, we're going to see about that. It is unconscionable that a defendant waive his right to jury trial and then profit by that waiver. Statutes are subject to interpretation, and this court's interpretation of the statute you cite differs from yours. Jesus Ortega, I sentence you to the state prison for life as prescribed by law. I expect the sentence will be appealed. The issue now is the tactics you employed. Mr. Darrow, I want you here at 9 o'clock Monday next, and I suggest you appear accompanied by counsel, because the court is going to decide whether to forward to the Bar Association Grievance Committee and the Supreme Court a transcript of today's proceedings with the request that you be disbarred. You will also, at that time, show cause why you should not be held in contempt. Court is adjourned. <laughs>